Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the webinar on Getting Into Food Service, the introduction. My name is Dolores Cerf, and, and I work for Alberta Agriculture, Forestry, and Rural Development with the Food and Bioprocessing Branch. I will be your host for today's webinar. <clears throat> During this 90-minute webinar, you will learn all about getting into the food service market, which can be a daunting process. This webinar will introduce you to food service. Giovanni Fernando and Marguerite Thiessen with Alberta Agriculture, Forestry and Rural Economic Development will present on the food service landscape, including the current food trends, the sector structure, and planning to strategically enter this market channel. Joining the discussion on strategic entry before you go to market will be a panel from the food service industry. Before we start though, here are a few housekeeping items. If you would like to ask a question, please click on the Q&A symbol at the top of your screen. I will make sure our presenters address all of the questions at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being rec recorded for your viewing pleasure late later. The link will be sent to you in an email after the live webinar. Our webinar today is scheduled for 90 minutes. We are anticipating approximately 75 minutes of presentation time and then 15 minutes for questions at the end. Our presenters today are Marguerite Thiessen and Giovanni Fernando, as I said, with Alberta Agriculture. Marguerite Thiessen works with our Food and Bioprocessing Branches Business Development Unit. She has worked with agriculture and food companies in Alberta for over 30 years. In her current role, this experience enables her to provide business coaching to companies working with the Food Processing Development Center and others looking to grow into the food service and retail market channels. After completing her bachelor's degree in agriculture sciences and an MBA, Giovanni Fernando moved to Australia from Sri Lanka in 2001 to do her master's degree. She then moved to Canada in 2004 with her family and completed her PhD in resource economics at the University of Alberta, specializing in the area of food consumer demand. In 2010, Giovanni began working as a provincial consumer market analyst with Alberta Agriculture. She is passionate about the food market dynamics and its impact on small and medium-sized businesses. This job was a natural fit. Her work involves search and procurement of the food market data, analysis and interpretation of market data, and provision of information to ministry and industry clients and general public through a web page and through various media, such as articles, presentations, webinars, radio segments, and others according to client needs. Our panelists today are Melissa Radu and Serge Belair with Explore Edmonton and Nicola Irving with Irving's Farm Fresh. Melissa is the Director of Social Environmental Sustainability. Melissa manages the long-term sustainability strategies at Explore Edmonton, stressing the importance of data and measurement in sustainability. Melissa works closely with these teams to set the benchmarks for year after year improvements and works to empower event professionals to collaborate outside of industry boundaries to drive positive change for future generations. As a result, their venues are accountable to high sustainability standards that differentiate them among the major event venues in North America and help position Explore Edmonton as a hub for community education around sustainability. As one of Canada's top culinary experts, executive chef Serge Belair displays his passion on every plate. Originally from Gatineau, Quebec, he studied, and I'm gonna mess this up, Serge, so please forgive me, Commission Soclair La Vallée de la Livre, and pardon my French, it's so bad, and refined his skills at the Hotel Clarion Gatineau's resort, resort, or restaurant La Pergola. Knowledgeable in French fine dining, Chef Serge's talents blend traditional plates with savory elements of surprise, emphasizing creativity and always pushing the limits. He ensures every dish is treated like a piece of artwork. Chef Serge leads one of Canada's top culinary teams and together they build on the Edmonton Convention Center's exemplary, exemplary Larry, reputation. Nicola Irving is a joint owner of Irving's Farm Fresh Limited with her husband, Alan. The Irvings have been in business for 16 years and operate a modern pork processing facility located on their farm near Camrose, producing artisanal products from locally grown pork and specializing in their own home-grown Berkshire pork. 
the Irvings have been selling their products to food service customers in Edmonton, Red Deer, and Calgary since 2006, with sales accounting for 25% of their revenue. They also direct sell to consumers and at farmers markets and retail stores across the province. I will now hand it over to Margaret, Marguerite and Giovanni to start us out. Thank you, Dolores. Um, so welcome everyone uh, this afternoon. So getting into food service uh, market channel can be a daunting process, especially uh, for those who might be thinking about entering this channel for the first time. Food service has a complexity and each subsector of this industry um, has different needs and ways that you would approach them. Therefore, this first webinar in the series is going to take you through some of this complexity with the aim to starting your planning to uh, strategically enter the marketplace. And as we move through the webinar, think about the question, what is the right market or sector of food service that best fits you, your business, and the type of products you produce. This information can help you decide which food service sector you're going to approach and why you might approach them. And in order to do this well, we will start with the food service landscape. Giovanni will talk about the industry trends and drivers, and I will talk about the structures found within the industry. And then during our industry panel, we will examine some of the questions around choosing the food service sector to approach and then identifying the right players. And so now I will turn it over to Giovanni to take us uh, through the industry trends and key drivers. Here you go, Giovanni. Okay, thank you, Marguerite. And thank you for having me here today. And thank you all for taking time to join us today. Uh, before, I begin my presentation, I would like to remind you that uh, this section is a bit heavy on numbers, uh, facts and figures, which I have uh, taken from food service uh, sector data from Statistics Canada, Industry Canada, and from various market research companies. Uh, one moment, as technical difficulty, I think. Okay, I want to see if I can move slides. Uh, Margaret? Uh, yeah, it, it should work. I gave you control. Okay. Yeah, um, I'm trying to page it down. It takes time, I think. If we can't get that to happen, Marguerite, do you want to just advance the, the, the page, please? Okay, thank you, Marguerite. Sorry about that technical glitch. So, yeah, I thought I should start my presentation providing this industry profile for Canada versus Alberta. Uh, Please focus on the circle numbers, and I hope this helps us to understand uh, the size of Alberta food service sector or the industry in, uh, with respect to Canada and its contribution to Alberta. For example, the dark blue circle shows you uh, the annual sales uh, uh, in Canada versus Alberta. For example, 85 billion worth of sales for Canada and 11 billion worth of sales for Alberta. And then uh, red circle shows you uh, the people directly employed, uh, 1.2 million in Canada versus uh, 150,000 in Alberta and so forth. And I think the purple circle is little important too, not, it's, it's highly important because uh, this food service sector um, uh, purchase 30 billion worth of food and beverages each year. Uh, that is in Canada and for Alberta that was about 4 billion. Uh, so uh, overall food service is an important industry in Alberta. Then if we can move to the next slide. Yeah, here I wanted to show you the industry structure. Uh, I know that Margaret will talk about this in detail. 
uh, but I'm giving you some numbers to understand the structure in Alberta. Uh, this shows you the industry composition based on number of locations and their size. Uh, the size is based on number of employees. Uh, so there are two main categories of food service or uh, accommodation, uh, commercial versus non-commercial. As you would expect, commercial segment is the largest with bigger number of uh, locations, a high number of locations for full service and limited service places. Uh, in terms of size, I would say a majority are categorized as small operations. As you can see here, uh, small operations uh, composed of uh, 6,000, uh, nearly 6,200 locations. To the next slide, please. And I was uh, here, uh, the food service sales in terms of uh, uh, two major categories commercial versus non-commercial and you can see from the sales figures how large they are and uh, be able to compare these two segments 74 billion uh, versus uh, 18 billion yes next slide and uh, when i was doing my research um, to prepare for this presentation of i found this interesting fact about the contribution of immigrants to this sector. As you can see, one in four workers in the food, food and beverage sector are immigrants, and immigrants accounts for 53% of all business owners with paid staff uh, in the sector. And at the bottom, you can see percentage of immigrant business owners in Canada. Um, and in Alberta, you can see that that's 59% of business owners are immigrants. So overall, this shows that immigrants are very important for can part of the, this industry. Okay, then here onwards, I'm going to just focus only on commercial food service segment uh, because you can find reliable data, facts and figures for non-commercial food service. Okay. When we talk about sector trends, we cannot forget about the pandemic impact. So when you go to the next slides, you'll see how the food service sales were affected during the pandemic. Uh, this figure shows food service sales from uh, 2000, June 2000 to June 2022, about 22 years of data. And as you can see, the sales uh, gradually increased with some seasonal variations. But see what has happened in April uh, 2020. Uh, the sales were drastically impacted. April reported the lowest sales in two decades. And as you can see there in the circled area, during that, eight, that 18 months, sales were uh, fluctuating uh, uh, below the trend line, I would say. So sales were drastically impacted. Then when you go to the next one, uh, food service employees, there's a small typo here, sorry about that. It should be food service employees, employees. Uh, so thousands of food service employees were laid off in Canada. Uh, this chart shows the ch job losses in March and April 2020. As you can see, the red, the red bar, food service and accommodation sector has the biggest loss of employees, laid off employees. The next slide. Uh, then when you look at the establishments, um, now number of establishments were operated during that period. Thousands of service establishments were closed in Canada. Uh, according to Restaurant Canada, by April uh, 2021, about 10,000 food service establishments have been uh, permanently closed, uh, the doors in Canada. And this figure was taken from uh, <clears throat> FS Strategy Inc. And according to this one, this indicate, uh, the impact was more or less similar all across uh, 
categories of commercial food services. You can see fast casual quick service food service. So the permanent close number of about 20, close to 27% locations are permanently closed and some are temporarily closed. And this shows you that um, pandemic impact in terms of uh, operations. Then uh, post pandemic trends. Now after pandemic with different stages of reopening of food service businesses, we can see the trends um, as a period of you know recovery and rebirth. Of course, with uh, what is happening around us, with the economic, uh, uncertain economic environment, geopolitical environment, the challenges ahead will be overwhelming. Uh, you know, restaurants are facing significant amount of debt, labor shortages, uh, food prices are skyrocketing, as well as the ingredient prices then supply chain issues. These are continue to cause, you know, headaches. And there's no doubt that, you know, pandemic will have lasting impact on the restaurant industry. Uh, but I would say that while it was challenging, it has brought many opportunities uh, for positive change and offer the ability to look at things differently. Yeah, when you look at the sales, they are, sales trends are looking good. Uh, you can look at the, the sale forecast versus actual sales in these two figures. Uh, it was forecasted that 2021 sales will be uh, 8.4 billion, but it was a bit higher than that. Actual figure was 8.5 billion. So the sales are looking good. And uh, when you go to the next slides, you can see the same trends in quarterly sales. Uh, this shaded area, you, um, I compared quarter one 2022 sales to quarter one 2021 sales. And as you can see in the right-hand panel, uh, uh, sales are picking up for special food services, full service restaurants, limited services, and so forth. Obviously, the biggest jump is for full service restaurant because they are the uh, they are the uh, you know segment that's the segment affected mostly during pandemic. Uh, in the next slide, I wanted to show how current inflationary pressure has affected food food purchase from uh, restaurants. I have used used uh, consumer price index numbers here and uh, look at the trend and the orange line is the year over year change so in july 2022 uh, you can see there's about 5.5 percent increase of menu prices compared to july 2021 so that is uh, that is what is happening uh, in terms of food price inflation in restaurants uh, moving into the next slide, in in uh, these slides, I'm going to dig a little deep into the consumer behavior trends. Uh, uh, this using NPD Crest data, I'm comparing data for 2021 to 2020. Uh, this slide shows percentage share of traffic uh, in day parts and in terms of service mode. Uh, which is on premises versus off premises. So as you can see from the um, uh, middle middle panel, like piece, uh, yeah, it says PCYA, that is percent change versus a year ago, all have grown compared to 2020. Also in the right hand side, spending, total traffic, average eat a check, all have been growing. So. The trend is looking good. To the next slides. Uh, this is the traffic share by segment. Uh, as you can see, full service segment uh, has posted the strongest growth compared to 2020. Uh, 2020. Uh, it's, it's kind of obvious as this is the segment that heavily impacted by the pandemic. Uh, 
the next slide here. Yeah. Uh, these are the top restaurant categories in Canada in 2021. Uh, visits to donut and burger places were the highest. And there's a number of other categories listed according to the number of uh, traffic. Next slide. I'm, I'm going a little faster <laughs> through these slides because uh, we are sharing these ones where you can get information later on. So the top chain share of traffic, uh, relate, it is a bit of related to the previous slide and of obviously Tim Hortons for donut and McDonald's for burgers for me. And the top 10 versus then the second uh, 10 ranks there. Then uh, to the top chain share of consumer spending, uh, consumers have spent higher share on Tim Hortons and McDonald's. Maybe after pandemic, they want to try <laughs> tasty food <laughs> from these restaurants. Okay, and to the next one, uh, top food items that was uh, sold in Canada in terms in terms of uh, number of servings, French fries, burgers, breakfast sandwich, and uh, chicken turkey top the list. And to the top beverages, hot coffee, carbonated soft drinks, slash coffee, and hot tea. Then to the fastest growing items, again, coffee, it's the first burger, breakfast sandwich, fries, and so forth. Then to the fastest declining items. Uh, I see a number of baked food items here. So you can get an idea of what is happening in the industry or in terms of consumer uh, food purchases. Okay, uh, that now uh, in this slide, the total food service traffic was analyzed in terms of different demographics, uh, age, household income, then gender and um, regions. In terms of age, highest visits were by uh, 45 to 64 age group and 18 to 34 age group became a close second. In terms of household income, visits were higher about the income group, uh, 60 to 150,000 and gender-wise, it is close to 50-50, but males were slightly higher. As one would expect, province with highly populated big cities reported higher visits than the others. Unfortunately, data do not sort of identify Alberta separately. Then to the next slide. Digital ordering traffic. This is the most talked about trend during the pandemic digital ordering. Uh, this shows how restaurant visits and consumer spending in 2021 in Canada. These are divided into digital versus non-digital orders, and there are some more information at the lower panel. Uh, the share of digital traffic in terms of restaurant app and third-party ag aggregators, and uh, delivery and carry out an on-premises share of digital orders. A little bit more on digital. Uh, the digital order, ordering uh, traffic or the, uh, that ordering numbers divided into day part, household income and age. Uh, digital ordering was mostly used during supper day part. In terms of household income, Obviously, high income groups used it more often. Uh, age breakdown is interesting. As we expect, 18 to 34 younger age group is the, they are the highest users. Okay, then we will look, here, look at some of the sector trends in terms of restaurant operation on, on the, from the perspective of operators. Now, according to Restaurant Canada's Restaurant Outlook Survey, three quarters of restaurant owners agreed that pandemic has forever changed the food service industry. About 90% is, is a big number. A percent of food service operators 
made many changes to their business in order to survive during the pandemic. Uh, more significantly, many of the operators say that they are going to keep these changes that they made to their businesses going forward. And when you look at the changes, uh, these are mainly focused on cost cutting and going digital. So in the next few slides, I'm going to discuss some major trends that will shape food service industry going forward. Next one. Now, the, this trend, this, we see this now, contactless ordering and uh, dining. Restaurants are increasingly use digital technology, especially touch-free technology, because of this. Uh, it is changing the way that restaurants are doing business and sort of enable new concepts. One, one good example is the ghost kitchen, also refers to as dark kitchens or virtual restaurants. As you may have heard of, uh, these kitchens have only a kitchen with no customer serving area. So interactions with customers only through digital. Uh, there are pros and cons of this new concept, but certainly used by many restaurant operators at the moment. Uh, according to a recent survey with restaurant operators, more and more restaurants are considering adapting additional touch-free technologies, mainly uh, contactless credit card payment acceptance and digital menus using either web-based or QR code ordering abilities. This contactless dining would help operators to reduce overhead costs, save money, improve customer experiences, reduce the number of ordering errors, and even increase employee tips. Into the next trend, delivery and takeout. We all know that not all restaurants offered takeout or delivery prior to COVID-19. But the pandemic forced many restaurants uh, or business to consider this option. We know that during pandemic, the majority of restaurant owners were entirely dependent on food delivery and takeout revenue. Uh, this, the same survey with restaurant operators I mentioned before, they talk about and uh, confirms that the delivery trend is continuing and this option is here to stay. stay. To offer these options, operators require digital infrastructure in place, uh, especially for customer order, uh, taking customer orders and payments. Also, they need delivery staff and other company resources. It is also the case that restaurants are increasingly using integrated third-party apps like Skip the Dishes, Uber Eats, and so on. So they do this directly on restaurant websites, and some are having built in, uh, built their own apps for this. Then for this next trend, streamlining menus. We know that owners were forced to operate within thinner margins during the pandemic. This situation has brought about some changes to restaurant menus. Uh, some starts, uh, some restaurants have started up offering limited menu options. Then some offer new dishes. Some completely change their menus, and some are, um, started to offer different options for current menu items, such as half orders or family size portions. Then to the next slide: yeah. uh, streamlining kitchen operations. Again, the restaurant food service operator survey, this one has revealed that restaurants are embracing new technology, uh, digital technology, to help improve their back office or the kitchen operations. Uh, many restaurants reported to have focused more on recruiting and training staff on new tech and some process changes in kitchen operations. Some of the new tech uses include kitchen display system showing all orders, uh, both in-house and delivery takeout on one screen, easy to read screens with built-in communication tools, and point of sales that integrates every aspect of the restaurant, such as online orders, 
inventory levels and so forth. Then uh, the last but not least, <laughs> next slide please. Yeah, the keeping customers happy and engaged is everybody's <laughs> objective. So the restaurant owners continue to explore new and innovative ways to capture their customers' interest. Going forward, many owners expect to implement new customer engagement initiatives to keep keep your customers happy and keep more business. Uh, some of the examples out there, you know, you can see um, at the engagement by responding to uh, customer communication. Communication is the key. So this includes responding to customer reviews on your web page, then answering calls right away and emailing and so forth. And lots of restaurants are using smart loyalty programs. And there are some very interesting examples out there. This is from the uh, US, uh, Dunkin' Donut. They have offering, uh, they, are, they have started to offer the priority services for loyal customers. So they're placing an order using a com uh, company app and customers can instantly get their orders when they arrive in and the, uh, the facility. So this is one example. You can find a number of examples out there. Then some have introduced meals and cocktail kits to go, then pre-made frozen meals, uh, subscription meals, and online meal preparation classes as well. So with that, that brings uh, this brings to the end of my presentation. There are some uh, takeaway messages from this section. Uh, and thank you for listening and hope you find this information valuable in planning your next business venture. With this, I'll turn this over to Margaret to talk to you about the food service industry structure in detail. Thank you again very much. Thank you, Jiwani, for the sector trend session. Jir, uh, excuse me, Jiwani shared that the sales channel information and she highlighted the two categories um, that the food service industry in Canada fall into. So I'm going to drill down a bit more and explain about these two categories, the commercial and non-commercial food service uh, sectors. So when we look at the commercial food service, you can segment it into um, the establishments where the core business is food and beverage service. And as Giovanni mentioned, this segment represents a prominent percent of the total food service sector. And within this sector, you'll find our full service restaurants, which include our fine dining, our casual and family restaurants, and those are often broken down further into chain restaurants and independent restaurants. Then we have our limited service restaurants, which include quick service restaurants. And those are even broken down further into street stalls, kiosks and fast food centers, cafeterias, uh, food courts and takeout and delivery establishments. And then we have the social and contract caterers, uh, sector and that's companies that manage food service in their other business locations and so for example a contract caterer may uh, supply an airline a railway or um, they have facilities where the social caterers are providing uh, food service for special events and the last one is our bar sector which includes bars taverns pubs cocktail lounges and nightclubs and primarily um, the key here is that they're serving an alcoholic beverage for an immediate consumption. Then when we look at the non-commercial food service sector, uh, it's those establishments where food service is secondary to their core business and uh, this segment represents a smaller percent of the total food service sector and within the segment you'll find the accommodation food service and that includes all food sold in hotels, motels and resorts. We have institutional food service like in hospitals, residential care facilities, in our schools, our prisons and factories and offices 
and then uh, in those remote, remote camps where they manage their own for food service facilities. Then we have the retail food service section and that's where you'll have meals and snacks sold at a department store, a convenience store or in an, another retail market channel. And then the other category uh, includes our vending machines, our sports and private clubs, our movie theaters, our stadiums, and anywhere where there might be seasonal or entertainment operations uh, included. <clears throat> but understanding the structure also in means we have to look at who are the other key players in the food service industry. And so if you look at the food service business itself, you have operators and owners, you have procurement teams, you have the chefs, and you have all the staff that play an integral part and have different roles within the food service operation. And then when you uh, look at our distributors, those are even broken down into, we have some that are called full line carriers and they have a complete selection of product categories. Then you have the broad line, um, they handle the majority of products, but not as many as a full line. Then you have your national, which have a capacity to distribute products all across Canada. And then we have uh, chain distributors and they only handle multiple unit accounts. And then we have independents and those aren't associated with a national or a chain. And then we have specialty um, distributors and they concentrate on a smaller range of product categories and maybe in select target markets or within an industry segment. And then the food service broker is a sales and marketing agent who's usually hired by the supplier to represent their products to potential food service operators. So it's really important to uh, think about developing a relationship with these players along the food su service supply chain and um, think about the benefits to all. So another thing to think about uh, when you're building and thinking about food service structure is where does your product fit into the brand promise of that food service? So the brand promise, the image, and the price points of the food service operation. And what does a brand promise mean when we're thinking of food service? Well, a brand promise in food service usually centers around the value or the experience that the customer can expect every time, um, every single time they interact with that food service company. And so some examples of these food service brand promises include uh, Montana Grill has eat great, do good, and Starbucks um, is inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, one neighborhood at a time. Then there's the image and it often reflects something like a green and clean or elegant and sophisticated and it's tied to the brand through the storefront, the signage, the decor, the food styling, the digital presence and even music is often tied to the image of the food service. And along with this goes uh, the signature dishes or the menu promise that invokes in people that when you go to this food service establishment, for example, um, it's the place to go. I want fresh cut potatoes in-house every day. And if I go there, that's their menu promise. Or if we, we give you the promise of quality food without any compromise on taste. So those are a couple examples of the menu promise. And so now I'd like to uh, welcome our first panel member, Melissa Rado, who is uh, the Director of Social and Environmental. Hi, Melissa. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, I'm losing my voice here. And my screen disappeared, so. Uh, and, and she's the <laughs> Social and Environmental Sustainability Director with Explore Edmonton. And uh, I have a couple of questions to get us started, Melissa. So what is the brand promise for Explore Edmonton Corporation? Hi, it's so great to be here and thank you for having me as part of the panel today. 
and to tell you a little bit about uh, the work that we're doing at Explore Edmonton and with our partners in food service. Explore Edmonton is the destination marketing and management organization for Edmonton. And we work very closely with uh, others in the greater Edmonton region and the surrounding region. And our work is really focused on generating economic prosperity for Edmonton. And we do that in a couple of ways. So we attract tourism dollars into our region with two of our world-class venues, the Edmonton Convention Center and the Edmonton Expo Center, so that we can host more meetings, events, and conventions in the city. Because when events come to our city, they uh, bring in people from all over the world or all over the country who stay in hotels, uh, go out uh, to restaurants, and generally support Edmonton businesses. And then the second thing that we do is, or the second thing I'll mention is that we raise Edmonton's profile as a tourism destination, both regionally, nationally, and on the international stage. Uh, stage sorry, because we want more visitors to want to come and visit Edmonton and bring uh, those very uh, important tourism spending dollars in into Edmonton and Edmonton businesses. Now, the last thing I'll say is that we operate as a corporate non for profit and that's really important because when it comes to generating economic prosperity, it's also about how that wealth is distributed uh, in our region. So because we are a non for profit it means that we exist not to uh, fund the pockets of, you know, a, a small number of shareholders. Instead, what we want to do is help to uh, re-inject those uh, dollars in into Edmonton and into Edmonton. Thank you, Melissa. So can you tell us a little bit about the environmental and social sustainability program that you're leading? Yes, I'd love to. So everything our team works on helps to make sure that our operations are operating in a responsible way. And that's both social culturally and environmentally. That's uh, very important for what we buy but also how we operate. So some of the things that we are very focused on is managing waste, uh, particularly packaging waste and food waste. In today's day and age, food waste we're finding is just really unacceptable to most people. Um, it's a problem that is felt all across Canada and is needing to take, we need to take some real action around it. Also, um, some of the work, the work that we're doing in the wayside is preparing for a number of uh, regulations we're expecting to see on the single-use plastics and single-use items. Now, with the growing urgency around the climate emergency, we're also doing a lot of work to understand and reduce our emissions uh, from our operations. A lot of that is uh, what we call scope three emissions. So those are emissions that uh, we have to account for both upstream in the supply chain and then downstream in the supply chain. And we work on developing products and services for visitors that come to Edmonton and come to our facilities to help them to also make more sustainable choices. And then the last thing I, I'll, I guess I'll say that is really, really important to us is um, using ourselves as an example to help to create more transformative change. So some, something I will say is our facility, uh, one of our facilities is over 500,000 square feet. Our other facility is 150,000 square feet. So if we can implement some of these initiatives in buildings of our size, then I really believe that anybody ought to be able to do something. Thank you. So how do those programs fit into Explore Edmonton's corporate food service strategy? Yes, thank you. So I want to talk about procuring locally because it's something that has always been um, a priority that we're trying to get better at doing in Explore Edmonton because buying locally and what we define as local is uh, within a hundred mile radius or 160 kilometer radius um, but in saying that we always want to try to procure 
from wherever the closest uh, available supplier is that uh, meets our needs. Um, we're still refining how we do this. In fact, this year we're going uh, through uh, our own procurement strategies and how we can make them better and help to serve uh, our mandate better. But the reason why buying from, there's a couple of reasons why buying from closer to us is, is good. It's really a win-win-win when we look at the sustainability side. First of all, and I know Chef Serge may touch on this as well, consumer sentiment in the meetings and events world tells us that local food and sustainable food is one of the main drivers for choosing an event venue. Far too many times people go to events you know, where a thousand person meal is served and the food is just dismal. It's, you know, it's cold or it's tasteless. And we have really broken through that kind of stigma because of our culinary expertise at the center. So we know that it's very, very trendy right now to talk about sustainable foods. And we include a lot of this in our messaging from a marketing standpoint. So it helps us to attract those events to our facility. We know having some of this messaging on our menus is certainly an advantage and it's a hook for people who are um, looking to make the purchasing decisions. The other two things that are important in our food service strategy related to sustainability are those emissions. So if, a, if, a tr if food has to travel from further away, the transportation emissions are of course going to be higher. And the other thing is when we have a direct relationship with some of our buyers or we know more about where our food is coming from, it makes that data a little bit more available to us. So it makes the carbon accounting process um, more transparent and we can get more, um, more credible uh, data that's available to us. You'll find with a lot of organizations, people are introducing more stringent emissions reporting. And so being able to have access to that is a huge benefit. And then, of course, when it comes to creating economic prosperity, uh, buying from organizations in our region is also helping to uh, support businesses, sometimes uh, small to medium sized businesses uh, in our region. And that means we're reinvesting some of that income into um, in a socially sustainable way and in a more equitable Thanks. And my last question for this section is, what do you look for a supplier in relation to the whole sustainability uh, program? Yeah. First is going to be on the packaging side. We're really looking for suppliers who um, are informed of what's happening uh, related to the Canadian uh, regulations around single-use plastics that is coming down the pipeline uh, and then also that maybe has some understanding of what's happening in our municipality because uh, Edmonton is looking at a single-use items bylaw so understanding being informed on that even at a broad level and maybe having some plans to respond to this transition is really helpful for us because our suppliers need to understand what the implications of that are going to be for our business on the waste management side. When we work with uh, local providers or providers that we have a good relationship with, we find that direct communication is really helpful because then we can help to co-create solutions for uh, limiting packaging. And that's a big deal for us because we feed a whole bunch of people. So, you know, we're not necessarily just buying one box of lettuce a week. You know, we are buying this large volumes so that that packaging really starts to make an impact on our waste diversion at the end of the year or, or throughout the year or we just happen to calculate at the end of the year. Um, local businesses also create benefits along the supply chain. Everyone right now is talking about the volatility that we have in the supply chain and once we start to shorten it, it helps us to kind of create um, some mitigation of those supply chain disruptions. So having um, less businesses along the supply chain is certainly advantageous to us um, when we start to look at contingency plans for some of this, uh, these supply chain issues. Um, and then lastly, well, there's two things that I'll say last, is 
sustainable products aren't always just the ones that are eco certified, you know, businesses that are B Corps or that sustainable harvest or FSC certified, you know, we do look beyond that. So if it's not always just about having the, the badge of honor or the, the specific certification, I'm not saying that those aren't, um, aren't useful in, in many ways, but there are 101 different labels out there. So for buyers, sometimes that can be difficult to navigate. So whatever it is you're doing on the social or sustainability side, um, having that very visible um, from uh, a marketing standpoint to buyers is very, very helpful. And that's also helpful for us as we look at creating storytelling for our customers. Because like I said, we like to feature some of our suppliers on our menu. And then uh, Marguerite, you, sp you spoke about brand promise, and this is what I'll finish on. Every food service organization has a, a brand promise, and we are really needing to partner with organizations that share our values. So we're developing, and a lot of businesses are developing more purposeful procurement strategies right now that include both social and environmental um, criteria. And, and so, you know, we all probably saw on the news this, um, you know, companies recently who are, um, Kind of being called out or losing a lot of business because of their particular stance on social issues so also consider highlight highlighting things like um if you're practicing inclusive hiring practices make sure that that's something that, that we can see uh, fair wages any philanthropic initiatives that you're participating in um, that's really a benefit to to help to disclose when when businesses are choosing who to buy from thank you melissa So uh, with our panel today, um, there we go, need my slide. So on top of the food service strategy and the fit, um, there are some other things that I want to point out. And um, to help me do this, to walk through these areas, uh, I'd like to welcome our other industry panel members. And uh, I have Serge Belair, who is the executive chef of Edmonton Convention Center, and Nicola Irving, who is the owner of Irving's Farm Fresh, along with Melissa, uh, to uh, work through this next section. And so I have a question for all the panels, um, and you can take your turns. So the first one is, from the trends that Giovanni spoke about, what's the most relevant um, to your operation? in regards to food service. I will let uh, Nicola go first. Okay, you're, you're saying Nicola goes first? <laughs> you're volunteering me? <laughs> Wait, yeah, That's okay. Yeah. Okay, I'll go first. Hi, everyone. Um, so the trends, I guess, the ones that are most relevant to us was I mean, she spoke a lot about the pandemic. And so when that first happened, having quite a big portion of our revenue coming from food service, we were obviously expecting to see a big drop off in that. And so we did lose some customers, but we also, uh, we were amazed at how many people opened up new restaurants during the pandemic. <laughs> so we gained a few. So overall, we didn't lose any any business in terms of revenue but the one thing that we really did see was a shift in the type of product that people were buying so instead of buying something to go in a full service restaurant where it would be uh, elegantly plated and served people moved to takeout and so they wanted things that would uh, easy to cook and store and keep warm and uh, don't uh, spoiled by being stuffed in a little takeout box. So the shift in what people were buying was was quite dramatic for us. So we 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 noticed a big um, movement towards uh, things like pork shoulder, which is used for making pulled pork. So people were making those types of dishes. Um, so I would say that that really is the the biggest um, you know of, of those trends, the biggest change that we've seen. Um, and I also, you know, we are seeing increased demand 
for for products gen generally so that those trends showing um food service receipts being higher now than they were you know a year ago is definitely we're seeing that that demand too so that was mine thank you nicola serge well, first off, thanks for having us. Uh, this is great, and it's nice to finally be able to voice our concern. <laughs> um, for us, it was totally the opposite. Unfortunately, as the convention center got hit with the COVID, that we went on shutdown, we were laid off, so it was brutal. But I got to see the side of being a customer, and like Nicola said, it's it's so true, everybody wanted to take out, everybody wanted to have easy cooking. So I was part of that uh, client that needed these items because I was stuck at home and I was trying to find something to entertain myself, like I would go out for dinner. So I'm quite sure every little small shop or industry felt that. And then when we reopened here at the center, we were lucky enough that we were operating as a, like a, for a homeless shelter. And then we partner up with a lot of people that were able to donate some of those excess product that they had on hand, which was a great relationship. So everything, everybody was a win-win, but clearly the pandemic hit everybody very hard, especially us, and we're still recuperating from this. And it's getting super busy now, but it's not up to what uh, it was originally forecasted, of course. And we're just adapting you know it just seems that everybody's so eager to go out there and gain what they lost in those two years so i feel like they're overbooking so don't get me wrong we're taking everything but now this season for us for christmas seems like it's gonna be a rough one which we're not complaining it's been two terrible ones so this is going to be a great one thank you serge and so my next question is uh, for you as well. Uh, what encourages you to purchase a new product? Well, basically we need to adapt most of the time to what's happening, but as a chef, for me, I'm, I want to speak for myself, is you're always trying to challenge yourself and to make sure you're up to trend. So you're always looking for the next best product. And like Nicola mentioned, I'm quite sure if the, if, the clients demand a certain product then they're going to deliver so that's exciting for us chef as well so we see different uh, new upcoming product and we're always trying to support local as uh, melissa mentioned which is very important for us and if there's a little uh, initiative to make something sustainable in their product they're selling like the packaging because i'm dealing with a lot of new guys or supplying us with items that are now made from corn so it's uh, biodegradable and it's very important. So when we see small packaging as chef here in the kitchen, especially on the scale that we are, we don't like to open 66 little package. We like to have a big package. And if the package is compostable, it's even better. The idea behind all this is to make sure we have new product and new offering to uh, like attract new clientele and always try to make sure that the current clientele we have is uh, always excited to come back year after year because they know that we're going to do something different and elevated and trendy, for sure. Thank you. So um, along with uh, the sustainability and uh, looking at new products, some of the other considerations, um, and I think Melissa touched on them a little bit earlier, and um, even in the trends, uh, Giovanni touched on them, is the menu itself, the labor and the procurement. So as a supplier, when you're making decisions, you have to think about what is that food service operator's considerations for that. So for labor, it's often centered around what problem can you solve? Um, you know, this has been one of the areas where Alberta suppliers have been able to strategically work with food service over the years. And um, right now, Restaurant Canada reports that between 150 to 170,000 vacant positions exist in food service in Canada. And so that's gonna affect the restaurants uh, who are closing because they can't get staff. Um, it's gonna affect the hours of operation. It's gonna affect the menu options. And um, you know, for some, it's like, what kind of innovations can I introduce to my food service like robotics to help with some of the labor issues. <clears throat> 
So Melissa and Serge, the next two questions are for you. So what are some of your cur uh, current labor challenges? Well, basically I'm quite sure everybody's in the same boat. So for us in the kitchen, we have been struggling a lot and we even seen people that are not, it's not even from their industry. They're clearly like, this is gonna be like their resource for uh, their income. And it's not even what their, their background is. And I don't wanna say that we're desperate, but we are hiring anybody that is a uh, willing or interested into this position. Cause this is really, it's a hard work. I'm not gonna lie, but it's even harder for somebody that's not from the industry. And the caliber of way we serve food here, it's uh, very intense and like massive production. So it's not for everybody. We are having difficult time and it's financially costing us money because we have to train them. And most of the time people, they stay, because at the center, I'm speaking for us now, like there's a uh, highs and lows and our higher time is Christmas time, of course. And then uh, like graduation time. And then we have some lower season. And then when the lower season comes, People move on, they trying to find another job so they don't come back. And then we spend some time training them, uh, supplying some uniform or anything that they need. But the, the key part that we have at the centers, we have a core team. We have uh, people that have been here for many, many, many years. And I think that's why we're still as strong as we are. We like to introduce young blood to our team, train them, but the core team itself, I've been here for 17 years and anybody that's with me, they've been here even longer. So thanks to these guys, we're able to uh, not drown. I'll be honest, we're barely making it. Now we have a solid team, but we just built that over the past four weeks. So it tells you how, like it's a fast pace and we're lucky enough that we're adapting pretty fast. And I'm quite sure it's everybody's in the same boat. Yeah, I can add up a little bit to that. Uh, I think one of the big challenges right now is, uh, particularly in the meetings and events space, um, the return to regular business has been really, there's been a lot of uh, ups and downs to it. So it's been relatively unpredictable. And as an employee, you know, a lot of uh, culinary, uh, of our culinary team would work on shift work, right? So it's very difficult to give Sort of that regular looking work week when some months we were very slow some months we had nothing at all some months we were very busy so that it doesn't create a lot of um consistency for employees who are you know needing to support their their life and their families with a pretty consistent paycheck the second you know and that's another challenge for us too is we've always um taken great pride in our internship programs uh, we've had a partnership with nate where we are able to educate uh, students who are taking their culinary arts program and set them up for their future careers. And that's one thing that is also difficult to do when you don't have the normal amount of business and learning opportunities for interns. And then last maybe is not necessarily a challenge, but something that we're looking at into the future, which is some sentiments, particularly from the Gen Z workforce, that the typical uh, assessment of, you know, job quality and morale certainly is still always going to be related to pay and related to benefits. But with Gen Z, particularly, we know that they have a greater emphasis on working for a company that is demonstrating environmental and social leadership. And so we're really looking at how do we change the way that we actually um, write these the organizational job descriptions to emphasize the things that we're doing within our company that create those added values for our employees. Thanks. And so how can a supplier um, or a product um, make a difference on the labor issue? Well, clearly, like ease of uh, usage, like packaging, con portion control, um like ready to use that's a big big play on product that sometimes that we purchase but here's not something it's not an approach that we practice but it's clearly something that's an incentive for us to maybe when we are in the pinch and we know that it's going to be super busy it's an att attractive product of course and if it's offered via any suppliers that can 
uh, support the demand that we're asking for because that's one tricky one most of the time too because when we are busy here it's like thousands and thousands of people so we need huge amount of uh, product so most of the time sometimes local product that's one thing that we run into they can support the demands that we have and again it's always uh, very around seasonal uh, like it's summertime it's super slow so then winter and so we have a good relationship with some of our local suppliers. So we ask them, okay, we need X amount of these, let's say carrots, and then they grow it for us during the summer. But when we have a new supplier, like we just uh, connected with the Stracona microgreens, and we need to give him a lot of heads up to be able for him to support what we need. And so far it's been knock on wood, a great relationship. It's so awesome. Like packaging items ready to use. Like, if you have to, you have to. <laughs> yeah, and I'll add up one thing too, because we know we, from from business perspective, we always have to manage our cost of goods sold and our labor. But they're, they tend to offset each other in some ways, right? If you're gonna buy a cheaper product that requires more prep work, then you can validate the extra labor hours because you're able to control your costs, the balance between those two costs. So I would say that, and, and this goes to uh, Nicola's point, right now, if we're trying to get hours for employees, then buying a whole product or a product that requires prep work at a lower cost may be a good option for some businesses, because it means then we can schedule employees, we can still meet our business objectives uh, related to expenditures. Thank you. Sure. And so Nicola, this one's for you. How has your business, or I know you talked about the way you've changed some of your product presentations, um, enabled you to help uh, the chefs or the food service that you sell to uh, make preparation in the kitchen easier? Oh, hopefully we didn't lose her. I am thinking her, she has frozen or has got kicked out because she hasn't moved. Okay. There's a matrix. Yeah. Well, when she gets back on, we'll uh, ask her that question. <laughs> um, was there anything else that uh, Melissa or Serge wanted to add um, to the labor issue and how, you know, a product can be innovative and help you with solutions? Well, what we've done in the past, which I've seen even before the pandemic, is like uh, some certain product that was our like pre-cut. This is something I'm still interested in. It's just now nobody's offering that at the moment. And I just think it's because we're coming out of this pandemic where like uh, specialty cut, like a vegetable tournée, a diced onion and stuff like that. It's something that sometimes I, like Melissa said, I prefer to do everything in-house. We take pride in that, but there's some times that we can't. So. Thank you. So there are some other considerations to think about and uh, in regards to menu and Melissa touched on that a little bit. Um, so you want to consider uh, how your product fits with the food service cost per plate and the average menu price margins acceptable to begin with. And my next question was for Nicola, but I'll come back. So hopefully uh, she'll be able to join us. So I'm just going to jump to the next one with Melissa and Serge. Oh, there's Nicola. Okay. I'm, um, I'm back. I'm, I, everything froze. <laughs> so I don't know. I missed a few, a few uh, minutes. So I'm okay. back. Okay. So, so I'm going to come back to the question. Um, how has your business or your products uh, been able to make preparation in the kitchen easier for food service? Okay. So few things that we do, bearing in mind we are a small business, so we do a lot of customized orders. So if um, a restaurant wants something cut a certain way, uh, we, we will do that for them. So every customer can specify the specification on, on how we cut things for them. So that's one way we do it. And the other thing I think Serge uh, mentioned was bulk packaging. So we, what we sell into food service is different to what we sell into retail. And so we offer a, a bulk, you know, bigger packages. And again, we let our customers choose what that is. Um, for some people, it could be a five kg package of 
bacon and other people it's a one kg right so we're trying to maximize shelf life things like that so yeah that's me thank you and so now we're talking about uh the menu and and the cost and the uh you know uh the the plate price so my first question was for you um how have you kept the menu price reasonable for our food service customers so it's difficult um so we do have uh structured pricing so for wholesale which would be our food service customers versus our, our retail and the way that we get those um we're able to sell a little bit uh, cheaper is by again the bulk packaging so it's less packaging cost for us it's often less labor cost um you know if you're going to put 10 pounds of uh, a product in 10 different packages that's that's a lot more time and money than it would be to put it in one package so um that really is is one of the main things uh, we've tried to keep our prices down we had a small price increase back in june uh, and that wasn't really so much a, a result of supply chain issues. It was more to do with the drought that we had here last summer. And obviously, we're farmers, so um, cereal prices are, are went through the roof because of the drought and obviously high fuel costs and things and some input costs. But I would say input costs don't really haven't really affected us that much. So. And then, um, how have you been able to? add value or make a point of differentiation when you're approaching a food service for uh, selling your product? So I think the biggest thing for us is, and the reason why our food service customers like working with us, is we offer, um, we go above and beyond with our level of service. So we are very attentive to the customer in terms of um you know making ordering easy we understand that buying locally is is very difficult for a lot of uh, food service establishments just because of you know the logistics around dealing with so many different suppliers so you know i do things like on a monday morning when i want to get my orders in i actually will uh, be proactive and contact my customers either through text or email or whatever way they they prefer to do that so we do that so it's that level of service it's delivering it when they want it on time i mean we do have some rules around it we don't just run around dropping off whenever but we try to deliver really good service and the other thing is is product quality so we always people want to have our product on their menus because it's it tastes great and it's and it's good quality and so maintaining that um is really important for us thank you nicola and so the next one is for melissa and serge uh what influences what you feature on the menu well i'll speak for that i'm sure <laughs> um of course season for sure has a big factor in there and of course the uh, the ingredients availability uh, and here at the center, what's happening is we change the menu every, we like to do it every year. So that's going to be our new trend, but previously it was every second year, but we do a lot of custom menu. So as a chef for me, this is very interesting. That's why I love this job so much. Like it's a challenge every time we, we do a lot of custom menu. So there's a client, they come here, they have a need and specific vision. And then we just uh, exchange ideas and what they would like to see on their menu. And I like to adapt with what they want. And of course, we try to source those items local. It's not always possible for financial reason, but when the client really uh, emphasize on having local and the sky's the limit for their budget, everything is possible. This is for me, very, very important. And this job is so nice because there's nobody really, as long as they're, it's in the cost of what they're expecting and what the big bosses want, I have so much freedom. It's very, very, um pleasing for me as a chef like this is like a, a box of sand and then we're just playing and like i'm still surprised sometimes i'm getting paid to do what i'm doing it's just awesome <laughs> <laughs> well and this one might not uh fit so much with uh your restaurant but 
I know sometimes there's a focus on menus. So, um, you know, some food service will focus on the time of day. So maybe their menus focused on the morning, the lunch, supper, or late snacking, or they're focused on that experience inside, or it's a takeout. Um, does that ever play in with your menu decisions? Or Absolutely. Focus? Oh, yeah. The best example is just we just did an outside catering for 650 people. So when I created that menu, I knew I would have to make this uh, those food item travel like a couple. They were about 10 blocks away. It was from the center to the uh, stadium for the health. It was a health then like for the football team and traveling uh, food on a plate. It's not the ideal solution. So when we created the menu, we had the specific item on the plate that was making like, I don't want to say that, but like we made a puree of a sweet potato that was like the glue on the plate to make sure all the vegetable didn't slide everywhere when the transportation was happening. Um, and of course, like you said, morning, breakfast and lunch. Sometimes we have a VIP breakfast. And if it's like at 6 a.m., I try to keep it light. If it's further down nine, you make it heavier because it's closer to lunch. So a lot of these times, like like I said, the center, it's like a playground. It's always uh, very, very different. So we have a custom, not a, a specific menu that is online all the time. And for some reason, it seems like nobody wants it. So they always ask the chef, can I have a special request? And of course, I do it uh, uh, smile on my face every time. And uh, does cultural cuisine or ethnic foods play a role in when you're redesigning menus? So it's funny because sometimes we get uh, specific uh, requests on like indigenous cuisine, African cuisine, and we are so lucky at the center that the team we have is so diverse, it's exceptional. So when this happens and we have like a, a Japanese cuisine, then we just pick one of our staff members' brains say, okay, what do you think? What can we make really authentic? So that way uh, we have people that can uh, be familiar to that ingredients on that plate. So the idea for us is to make sure that when the client comes here, they have a, a memory attached to what they're eating. So for I'm not Japanese, so if I can, pick somebody's brain and they're like, hey, what did you eat in your childhood that somebody else is Japanese can associate to this dish? And then we put on a dish and like, oh, wow, this is so authentic. And basically we're just playing with emotion and feeling. So that's what's so great about food. People can relate to that. And we have Mexican, Span uh, Spanish, indigenous, of course, Japanese, Chinese, like it's awesome. And I think this makes our team even stronger. And of course, the food more authentic. That's what we're trying to do. But the main menu online is uh, mainly uh, Alberta focus. Melissa, you want to add to this? <laughs> yeah, it's just really interesting that you asked that question, Marguerite, because we had an event earlier this year and they requested um, different cuisines from all around the world because a big focus of their conference was diversity and inclusion. And food has this amazing way of starting conversations and creating kind of a bond between people. So I think more and more featuring foods from all around the world is something that even though we are in Alberta, we're expecting to see a lot more. The other thing that's really interesting from sort of a dietary equality place is uh, what's going on to the plates at the convention center is really changing because of consumer preferences regarding diet. So um, you showed earlier that um, baked goods and bread products were trending downward in a lot of ways. And a lot of that is likely due to dietary or maybe due to dietary. So uh, what, what Surge designs as a menu also has to take into account um, people who are um, lactose intolerant, who are gluten-free, who are choosing to uh, have a plant-based diet uh, through veganism or vegetarianism. And um, we're really lucky to have Chef Serge because he's incredibly responsive to, to plan. It kind of reminds me of that uh, new Netflix show. It's, um, or no, it's not Netflix, so it's on the Food Network. It's, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of it now, but it's um, where they have to, the 
the cooks have to try to serve a whole bunch of different picky kind of requirements. And uh, sometimes I feel like that chef, chef should be on that show because um, he does an incredible job even when it's a thousand person conference with lots of special requests. Thank you. And so then procurement and other requirements are also a consideration when you're building your strategy to um, approach food service. And so I'm going to ask some of those questions now. So what are the requirements that you need to do business in food service? And it could be any of you who answer this question. And no Nicola knows these ones, because if you have a facility, um, I'm going to say you you mentioned quality and you mentioned consistency what about food safety so depending on who yeah who your customer is you may require different levels of uh, food safety plans so most of our customers are small independent uh, restaurants um so their requirements we have a obviously the minimum is that you are producing in a inspected facility uh, for us it's a provincially inspected meat facility so not a federal one so we have to stay within alberta um, we have our own food safety plan we're not HACCP uh, registered so that rules us out from working with um, some bigger places but that's okay because we don't have the supply to work with big uh like chains or, or um like Serge mentioned about the, you know, the convention center is, you know, the volume of product that you need wouldn't wouldn't fit for a, a business like mine anyway. So yeah, so food safety is very important. Having a food safety plan or or having your HACCP certification, which is you know the hazard analysis um, part of part of that. So so yeah, food safety, product quality being consistent, um, having you know, um, consistent within an order, but also consistent from one order to the next. So, you know, don't send something one size one week and then the next week when they order it goes as something different. So there, you know, for costings and um, serving sizes and things like that, uh, restaurants are looking for consistency. That can be a challenge, again, for a smaller producer, especially with, with meat. Um, and uh, but you know that's that's something that we 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 have to deal with with each individual customer that we have. Thank you, Nicole. And I think we've talked about you know packaging sizes and cases. Um, so I'm going to go to the next question, which is, are there any requirements for point of sale, promotional, or educational tools that the food service might ask of the supplier? to help them with training staff, those kind of things? One thing that I really don't like is everything, for some reason, is an ounce. And in the kitchen, every in Canadian kitchen, and especially in my kitchen, everything is by grams or kilos. So when we're creating recipes and we're ordering from the kitchen to our, like our software uh, recipe system, then we order, go to order, then in their, in their system, everything is an ounce. It's so I think that's because the American like switch, I'm not too sure. So that's one that is very tricky as well. And then again, we touched, we touched about that, like the packaging size of product, very important for us at the center for our need is to have everything in bulk as much as possible. Like sometimes we order a clamshell and they're in package of 200, but sometimes we need, I can order like 10,000. So I imagine how many boxes of that if they come in boxes of 100. And it's something that not everybody thinks about. I understand they're trying to serve a smaller uh, clients, but ideally it'd be nice maybe even when we order it, okay, what size, maybe it's something they can offer. What size would you like those to be packaged in? That way we have less waste. And if it's small packaging, again, uh, recyclable or compostable is very important for us. Yeah, definitely. Uh, making sure that whatever packaging materials are are coming to us uh, have we can identify what those materials are made from is very important. So uh, the recycling market is always changing, and it's particularly hard from for businesses that work in the ICI waste space, so the in institutional, industrial, and commercial buildings. 
um, we it's up to us to work with our own waste service providers and uh, it's up to our team to source sort materials and make sure they go to the right place so knowing what materials um, are is super helpful uh, the other thing I'll say is food waste is a massive issue and uh, we do our very best to make sure that uh, food waste can be composted but also that food isn't going bad so making sure that best before dates are easy to see, very visible, is really uh, important for us so that um, as we're receiving and as we're doing the first in, first out um, sorting, we love to have visible uh, best before dates that uh, save us a bit of time in searching. Thank you. So some final considerations uh, to think about when you're building your strategy is who is expanding in the food service uh, market? Who's looking to enhance their product portfolio? Who's looking to shorten or shore up their supply chain by adding more domestic products and replacing uh, imports? And who's integrating technology? And how does your business address those kind of things in your plan? So as a food pro producer or processor, ask yourself, can I address any of these with my product or through my business? And my final question to the panel, is what are your top four things you look for? Hmm. Quality for sure, costs, <laughs> and again, sustainability is very, very important. Packaging, like I cannot emphasize on how much packaging is important. I know that now it's hard for everybody to get what they really want. We are adapting as we're going along here because sometimes. Uh, like Nicola mentioned, we can have a product that is certain size last this week and then next week it's like everybody I think struggling because the demand is so high now that everybody's just with the shortage of staff just trying to do what they can do on a daily basis. And I think it's not just us, it's in every aspect of the industry, not even food related, it's everybody. Even maybe the packaging facilities having issues to provide packaging. It's, it's, it's brutal. Nicola? Okay, so my top four would be, I would look uh, first and foremost for somebody to, uh, that genuinely wants to buy local and support a, a local farm, okay? Um, I want them to represent our product well. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't expect our name to be on the menu, but often it is because it, the, you know the customers we have see that as a as a selling point for them um on a business uh from a business perspective i'm looking for customers that um can run a, a business i.e they can order on time they can pay on time all of those kind of things that that's a as a supplier that's a huge thing i've had my fingers burnt many 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 times um with uh you know giving people too much credit and then them not paying or, or going out of business and being left as a small supplier you 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 know you you're last on the list to get paid out so that's something um and then choosing somebody that is the appropriate size and scale for your business right don't go into it as a small business thinking that you can sell to a big uh, chain because it just you likely won't be at the right price point you won't have the supply you won't be able to do what they need you to do so find somebody that you can really work with at your scale and comfortably supply the volume and so you're not they're not putting you under pressure and you're not letting them down that those would be my my top four things Thank you. And Melissa, did you have anything to add? Yeah, thank you. I just want to say very quickly that there's so many competing, um, you know, demands for what we buy. And uh, that's, that makes chef's, hard, uh, chef's job rather hard. And I just want to say that we, we still are figuring out so much on the sustainability front. So we've, we've definitely made movement in some areas, but we certainly have a journey ahead of us still. And so making sure that these, these criteria are part of the procurement decision for me is, uh, is still making great progress. For me, they would be availability of the product to serve our needs, packaging, of course, which was already mentioned, 
I want to look at the business's sustainability practices and very close to what Nicola said, we also want to look for a product that we can represent well to our customers. So that's, uh, I think, always part of the matchmaking exercise of finding the right supplier. Thank you. So we're at the part of the webinar now where the participants get to ask you questions. So if you haven't done so, please write your question in the question chat box. And Dolores is going to be addressing the questions. So I'm turning it back to Dolores. All right, thank you, Marguerite. Um, let's see. I, I'm just reading comments here. It's like, nope, there is no questions that that anyone actually needs to answer at this point. I would just like to say thank you very much, though, Serge, Melissa, Nicola. I learned so much from listening to the three of you speak. It's just amazing. Um, Juwani and Marguerite, thank you for sharing everything. I loved all the stats, Juwani. It was like it makes you really think outside the box here sometimes. Um, and there are no questions. So I would like to just say thank you so much for, for taking the time out of your busy days to um, to spend some time with us this afternoon. To everybody who's on the webinar, you will receive a short survey at the end of this and your help um, in answering it will help us a lot in, in determining what kind of webinars that we can do for you going forward. So please take a couple of moments to uh, complete the survey. And once again, everybody, thank you so very much for, for um, doing everything for us today. Much appreciated. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.